Last time we were talking about bonds, and so there were three kind of divisions, technically two, ionic and covalent, and we talked specifically um, about then that covalent could be subdivided. So really there's covalent bonds, which is where we're sharing electrons, and then there were ionic bonds where, one, where there was a transfer of electrons. One thing sort of steals electrons from the other. The thing with the sharing is that it could either be even sharing, where it's just, they sometimes just call it a covalent bond, or they call it a nonpolar covalent bond, and that means that both atoms are sharing the electrons sort of evenly. So you can imagine that the electrons are spread evenly around both of these. In a polar covalent bond, one of the elements involved, it would be two different elements, and one of them is more electronegative, meaning it pulls harder on the electrons than the other. So although the electrons are hanging around all of it, they're sort of spending more time around this one. And so it ends up with what's called a partial negative charge, because electrons themselves are negative, so they're making this side a little bit negative. And the other side ends up a little bit positive, because remember that the nucleus has a positive charge. So if the electrons are leaving this side, whereas they would normally balance each other out, the protons and the electrons, if they're hanging around here, the side's going to be partially positive. But both of these involve sharing. And then the transfer of electrons, this is ionic bonding, where one thing basically takes electrons from the other. And you end up with full charges here. See how the sodium has a positive and the chlorine ends up with a negative, and the opposite charges sort of hold them together. So we talked about that last time. Today we're going to start by talking about what are called intermolecular forces. So the word inter means between. So these are attractions between separate molecules. For example, think about how you are a single person, but you could shake hands with somebody else. Think about the shaking of hands as like an intermolecular force. For a temporary period of time, you would be attached to them, attracted to them, so to speak, and then you'd let go. That's what intermolecular forces are. They're, they're weaker than real bonds, and they're kind of made and broken all the time. So there's two different ones. The first one is called van der Waals forces, and there's a reason we have a little gecko here. It's because van der Waals forces, the example that's always given in biology books of van der Waals forces, is how geckos can stick to glass. And it has to do with these little pads on their feet. Under a microscope, you'd see that there's millions of tiny little fibers composing these little pads on their feet. And they create almost like a static that helps them to stick to the glass. So what happens with van der Waals forces is that, remember how electrons are always moving. So when we draw atoms, or when we did our little uh, simulation, we kind of showed the electrons as if they're kind of perfectly evenly spread around like this. But the truth is, they're not always sitting in one spot. Instead of sitting in that same spot, what can happen is they can be moving. And so at any given split second, you might have more electrons over on this side of the atom, making it slightly negative over here. And because the protons are still here, but there's no electrons on this side, or there's less electrons, it becomes slightly positive. And then because the electrons are always moving, maybe there's more over here for a split second, or maybe there's more over here for a split second. So even though we draw them like they're in this perfectly evenly spread way, their random motion creates little tiny charges, very, very, very weak charges that are very temporary, and they're so weak that we almost never notice them. But when you combine those, like the gecko's feet, where there's millions and millions of these little tiny charges, then we actually notice a difference. Sort of like if you got bit by one mosquito, you might not even notice it. But if you went into the Everglades in an area where there were thousands and thousands of mosquitoes, they could actually make you very sick or even kill you because so many little tiny mosquitoes biting you at the same time would have an effect. And that's like this, very weak, but it can have an effect when you're talking about uh, lots of these forces. The more important one, really, that we're going to spend more time on is hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds are specifically between hydrogen, which is where the name comes from, and they, it can actually only happen with hydrogen and then three other things, which are nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And this is, again, an intermolecular force between two separate molecules. 
Hydrogen bonds are always represented by dotted lines. So anytime you ever see dotted lines holding atoms together, like here in DNA or here in the water, that is always going to be an intermolecular force, specifically a hydrogen bond, which means it's hydrogen bonding to one of those three elements. And this is actually what holds water molecules together in liquid. So when you think about water molecules, this is one, this is one, this is one, but why don't they all float away? Why are they liquid? Well, it's these hydrogen bonds, and they are sort of these temporary attractions. They are, again, weaker than a real bond. Um, they're being made and broken all the time. The water, that's why it's liquid, is that the water molecules are making these, breaking these, and they're sliding past each other and making new ones. And in the center of DNA, you also have these hydrogen bonds. And even in DNA, they're very weak. Uh, it allows your DNA to actually open up and unzip and make copies of itself and do all kinds of things. So these are very weak. Um, they're, bond, they're called bonds, but they're, I'd like to say they're more like very strong attractions. Think of them more like Velcro. If you think of like cement holding something together, that would be like the covalent bonds of water. If you think of the hydrogen bonds in water, it's more like the, it's Velcro that you could like push together and then pull apart very easily. So let's talk a little bit more about water. So water is, of course, H2O. The bonds in water are polar covalent bonds. So what happens with water, and you definitely need to know this, is that oxygen has a very high electronegativity. It actually has um, a bunch of electrons around it. It actually has six. And what it ends up doing is it ends up sharing two of them with the hydrogens. But hydrogen only has one electron, so it's not really pulling very hard on the electrons. It shares with oxygen, but the electrons sort of hang around oxygen more because of this high electronegativity, which again is a pull on the electrons. Well, remember what happens in a polar covalent bond is that the element that the electrons are hanging around more ends up with a partial negative charge, and this partial symbol it looks kind of like a figure eight that you didn't close. So this is a slight negative charge on the oxygen. And then you also end up with slight positive charges on the two hydrogens because the electrons are hanging around the hydrogens less. So this is what a single water molecule would look like. It would be hydrogens, two hydrogens and an oxygen, H2O. And you would have these partial charges, which are important. So make sure you know these, these charges on here. Negative, positive, positive. So what ends up happening, this is what this just says, the same thing I just said, is you end up with these partial, partial positive and partial negative charges within a molecule, and then between the water molecules, you end up with hydrogen bonds. So we just talked about hydrogen bonds. So remember how they're dotted lines. So what would happen is this water would be attracted to a second water molecule, and it's specifically opposites that attract, by the way. Make sure you know that. This is the oxygen of another water, which has a slight negative. And notice the negative of this one and the positive of this one, the opposite charges, attract one another, and you get the hydrogen bond. And this is important. One water can actually make up to four hydrogen bonds with other water molecules around it. And this is going to give water some very unique properties. So again, the hydrogen of one to the oxygen of another. So here's a picture of a single water. This is a, a called a space filling uh, version. It's a little different drawing, but it's the same concept. This is slightly positive, slightly positive, and the oxygen is slightly negative. And then that's going to cause it to be attracted to other water molecules. One water molecule can actually be attracted to four others. And notice, again, very important, it's the hydrogen of one to the oxygen of another, and here's the oxygen of one to the hydrogen of another. The opposite partial charges attract, and the dots are those hydrogen bonds. The polar covalent bonds are these sticks here. Those are not breaking. H2O stays H2O, whether it's ice, whether it's water, whether it evaporates into the air, it's still H2O. This does not break. But when water evaporates or you boil it away in a pan or a pot, these bonds break the dotted lines. That's why they're not really strong bonds. Like I said, they're very just strong attractions.
So characteristics that water has because of these attractions. First, it's cohesive. It sticks to itself really well. We're going to do a little lab with pennies, and you're going to see how well the water sticks to itself. Secondly, it's adhesive. It likes to stick to other things, and it actually travels up plants because of the fact that it, uh, it sticks to the little internal tubes inside of the plants. It also has a high surface tension, meaning the water molecules on the surface, they actually make little hydrogen bonds to each other, and this prevents little things from falling through the surface. And that's surface tension. You can see the bug here, how he can stand on the water, and it's almost like an invisible film. You can also float a paper clip on water, same concept. It's not because the paper clip's less dense. If I push this paper clip, it would fall through. But if you set it down very, very lightly, it will actually rest on top. And that is the surface tension of water. How does water get from the roots of a tree to its leaves? The evaporation of water from leaves moves water molecules up from the roots. The evaporation exerts a pull that is relayed downward along a string of water molecules from leaf to root. Hydrogen bonds cause water molecules to stick together, a phenomenon called cohesion. As each water molecule evaporates, it pulls on the next water molecule, and it pulls on the next. This relays the pull of evaporating water molecules all the way down to the roots. The cohesion of water helps to keep gravity from pulling the water molecules back down. So that's how water travels. It's also, again, capillary action. Inside of the plants, there's these microscopic tubes, which you see here. They're called xylem, and the water is also attracted to those. And so the water molecules, if you imagine, um, if you've ever uh, gone to the doctor and they pricked your finger to get blood, and they touch this little teeny glass tube and the blood goes up the tube, that's capillary action. Imagine that inside plants you have hundreds of these little tiny tubes very similar to that, very skinny little tiny tubes. The water is attracted to them, and it's getting pulled up by being evaporated at the leaves, and so you end up with water traveling against gravity of a plant. Water is also called the universal solvent. It's not exactly true. It doesn't dissolve everything, but it's, it dissolves more things than any other solvent on the planet. So a solvent is a substance that dissolves things. Um, the solute is what gets dissolved. So, for example, salt dissolves in water. Salt would be the solute. Water would be the solvent. And then the two together make what's called a solution. It's, it's a mixture. So ionic things or polar things dissolve really well in water. They form what are called aqueous solutions, which just means sort of a watery solution. It does not dissolve nonpolar things. For example, oil is nonpolar covalent, no charges. It is not attracted to water, and that's why oil and water don't mix. But salt, for example, if you put salt, sodium chloride, into water, it'll break into ions. Notice how the positive hydrogens of the water are attracted to the chloride, the negative, and the negative oxygens of the water are attracted to the positive of the sodium. So because sodium chloride has charges, it's attracted to the polar molecules of water, which also have partial charges. Water also cools you down. It can absorb a lot of heat. There's actually a word for this. It, it's that water has a high, what's called specific heat. So it can absorb heat from the environment without actually warming up very quickly. And it also holds on to heat well and doesn't cool very quickly. So this keeps temperatures in lakes and things steady, and it keeps your body temperature steady because water molecules tend to be able to absorb and release heat energy without actually getting hotter or colder. So a lake stays very stable. Um, as molecules evaporate from your skin, this is called evaporative cooling, it uses your body heat as its energy source to evaporate. And so the way sweat cools you is that as it evaporates off your skin, it takes your body heat with it. The next one is that ice floats. Ice is actually less dense than water. When water freezes, the hydrogen bonds sort of push the water molecules apart. And this makes ice less dense than water, so it floats, and this would prevent a lake from freezing. So you get this layer of ice, and it could be negative 10 degrees outside, but below the ice, it's going to stay above freezing. 
because it's going to insulate everything underneath. So ice being less dense is fantastic for keeping organisms that live under the water alive. And this shows liquid water close together, but in ice, notice how the molecules are much further apart.